this had nearly tossed me off into the sea and now i lost no time crawled back along the bowsprit and tumbled head foremost on the deck i was on the lee side of the forecastle and the mainsail which was still drawing concealed from me a certain portion of the after deck not a soul was to be seen the planks which had not been swabbed since the mutiny bore the print of many feet and an empty bottle broken by the neck tumbled to and fro like a live thing in the scupper suddenly the hispaniola came right into the wind the jibs behind me cracked aloud the rudder slammed too the whole ship gave a sickening heave and shudder and at the same moment the main boom swung in board the sheet there were the two watchmen sure enough red cap on his back as stiff as a handspike with his arms stretched out like those of a crucifix and his teeth showing through his own for a while the ship kept bucking and sidling like a vicious horse the sails filling now on one tack now on another and the boom swinging to and fro till the mast groaned now and again too there would come a cloud of light sprays over the bulwark and a heavy blow of the ship's bows against the swell so much heavier weather was made of it by this great rigged ship than by my home at every jump of the schooner red cap slipped to and fro but what was ghastly to behold neither his attitude nor his fixed teeth disclosing grin was any way disturbed at every jump too hands appeared still more to sink into himself and settle down upon the deck his feet sliding ever the farther out and the whole body canting towards the at the same time i observed around both of them splashes of dark blood upon the planks and began to feel sure that they had killed each other in their drunken wrath while i was thus looking and wondering in a calm moment when the ship was still his raw hands turned partly round and with a low moan writhed himself back to the position in which i had the moan which told of pain and deadly weakness and the way in which his jaw hung open went right to my heart but when i remembered the talk i had overheard from the apple barrel all pity left me i walked aft until i reached the main mast come aboard mister hands i said ironically he rolled his eyes round heavily but he was too far gone to express surprise all he could do was to utter one word brandy it occurred to me there was no time to lose and dodging the boom as it once more lurched across the deck i slipped aft and down the co it was such a scene of confusion as you can hardly fancy all the lockfist places had been broken open in quest of the chart the floor was thick with mud where ruffians had sat down to drink or consult after wading in the marshes round their camp the bulkheads all painted in clear white and beaded round with gilt bore a pattern of dirty hands dozens of empty bottles clinked together in corners to the rolling of the ship one of the doctor's medical books lay open on the table half of the leaves gutted out i suppose for pipe lights in the midst of all this the lamp still cast a smoky glow obscure and brown as umber i went into the cellar all the barrels were gone and of the bottles a most surprising number had been drunk out and thrown away certainly since the mutiny began not a man of them could ever have been sober foraging about i found a bottle with some brandy left for hands and for myself i routed out some biscuit some pickled fruits a great bunch of raisins and a piece of with these i came on deck put down my own stock behind the rudder head and well out of the coxswain's reach went forward to the water breaker and had a good deep drink of water he must have drunk a gill before he took the bottle from his mouth eh said he by thunder but i wanted some o that i had sat down already in my own corner and begun to eat much hurt i asked him he grunted or rather i might say he barked if that doctor was aboard he said i'd be right enough in a couple of turns but i don't have no manner of luck you see and that's what's the matter with me as for that swab he's good and dead he is he added indicating the man with the red cap he warn't no seaman anyhow and where mought you have come from well said i i've come aboard to take possession of this ship mr 
hands. And you will please regard me as your captain until further notice. He looked at me sorely enough, but said nothing. Some of the color had come back into his cheeks, though he still looked very sick and still continued to slip out and settled down as the ship banged about. By the by, I continued, I can't have these colours, Mr. Hands, and by your leave, I'll strike him. Better none than these. And, again dodging the boom, I ran to the colour lines, handed down their cursed black flag, and chucked it overboard. God save the king, said I, waving my cap. And there's an end to Captain Silver. He watched me keenly and slyly, his chin all the while on his breast. I reckon, he said at last, I reckon, Captain Hawkins, you'll kind of want to get ashore now. Suppose we talks. Why, yes, says I with all my heart, Mr. Withers's hands. Say on and I went back to my meal with a good appetite. This man, he began, nodding feebly at the corpse, O'Brien were his name, a rank Irelander this man, and me got the canvas on her, meaning for to sail her back. Well, he's dead now, he is as dead as Bilge, and who's to sail this ship I don't see. Without I gives you a hint, you ain't that man, as far as I can tell. Now, look here, you gives me food and drink and an old scarf or anchature to tie my wound up, you do, and I'll tell you how to sail her, and that's about square all round. I, I mean to get into North Inlet and beach her quietly there. To be sure you did, he cried. Why I ain't such an infernal lubber after all? I can see, can't I? I've tried my fling. I have, and I've lost, and it's you has the wind of me. North Inlet. Why, I haven't no choice. Not I. I'd help you sail her up to execution dock. By thunder, so I would well, as it seemed to me. That we struck our bargain on the spot. In three minutes I had the Hispaniola sailing easily before the wind along the coast of Treasure Island, with good hopes of turning the northern point ere noon, and beating down again as far as North Inlet, then I lashed the tiller and went below to my own chest, where I got a soft silk handkerchief of my mother's. With this, and with my aid, hands bound up the great bleeding stab he had received in the thigh, and after he had eaten a little and had a swallow or two more of the brandy, he the breeze served us admirably. We skimmed before it like a bird, the coast of the island flashing by and the view changing every minute. Soon we were past the high lands and bowling beside low, sandy country, sparsely dotted with dwarf pines, and soon we were beyond that again and had turned the corner of the rocky hill. I was greatly elated with my new command, and pleased with the bright, sunshiny weather and these different prospects of the coast. I had now plenty of water and good things to eat, and my conscience, which had smitten me hard for my desertion, was quieted by the great conquest I had made. I should, I think, have had nothing left me to desire but for the eyes of the coxswain as they followed me derisively about the deck and the odd smile that appeared continually on his face. It was a smile that had in it something both of pain and weakness, a haggard old man's smile. But there was, besides that, a grain of derision, a shadow of treachery, Twenty-six Israel hands the wind, serving us to a desire, now hauled into the west. We could run so much the easier from the northeast corner of the island to the mouth of the north inlet. Only, as we had no power to anchor and dared not beach her till the tide had flowed a good deal farther, time hung on our hands. The coxswain told me how to lay the ship to. After a good many trials I succeeded, and we both sat in silence over another meal. Captain said he at length with that same uncomfortable smile, Here's my old shipmate, O'Brien. Suppose you was to heave him overboard. I ain't partic lar, as a rule, and I don't take no blame for settling his hash, but I don't reckon him ornamental now. Do you I'm not strong enough, and I don't like the job. This here's an unlucky ship, this Hispaniola, Jim, he went on blinking. 
There's a power of men been killed in this Hispaniola, a sight o' poor seamen dead and gone since you and me took ship to Bristol. I never seen such dirty luck, not I. There was this hero brain now, he's dead, ain't he? Well, now I'm no sculler, and you were a lad as can read and figure, and to put it straight, do you take it as a dead hands, but not the spirit? You must know that already, I replied. O'Brien there is in another world, and may be watching us. Says he, well, that's unfortunate appears as if killing parties was a waste of time. Howsomever, spirits don't reckon for much by what I've seen. I'll chance it with the spirits, Jim. And now, you've spoke up free, and I'll take it kind if you'd step down into that there cabin and get me a well. A shiver my timbers, I can't hit the name on. Well, you get me a... The whole story was a pretext. He wanted me to leave the deck so much was plain. But with what purpose I could in no way imagine. His eyes never met mine. They kept wandering to and fro, up and down, now with a look to the sky, now with a flitting glance upon the dead O'Brain. All the time he kept smiling and putting his tongue out in the most guilty, embarrassed manner, so that a child could have told that he was bent on some deception. I was prompt with my answer, however, for I saw where my advantage lay and that with a fellow so densely stupid I could easily conceal my suspicions to the end. Some wine, I said. Far better. Will you have white or red? Well, I reckon it's about the blessed same to me, shipmate, he replied. So it's strong, and plenty of it. What's the odds? I'll bring you port, Mr. Hands, but I'll have to dig for it. With that I scuttled down the companion with all the noise I could, slipped off my shoes, ran quietly along the spared gallery, mounted the forecastle. I knew he would not expect to see me there, yet I took every precaution possible, and certainly the worst of my suspicions proved too true. He had risen from his position to his hands and knees, and though his leg obviously hurt him pretty sharply when he moved, for I could hear him stifle a groan, yet it was at a good, rattling rate that he trailed. In half a minute he had reached the port scuppers and picked, out of a coil of rope, a long knife, or rather a short dirk, discolored to the hilt with blood. He looked upon it for a moment, thrusting forth his under jaw, tried the point upon his hand, and then, hastily concealing it in the bosom of his jacket, trundled back again. This was all that I required to know. His roll could move about, he was now armed, and if he had been at so much trouble to get rid of me, it was plain that I was meant to be the victim. What he would do afterwards, whether he would try to crawl right across the island from North Inlet to the camp among the swamps, or whether he would fire Long Tom, trusting that his own comrades might Yet I felt sure that I could trust him in one point since in that our interests jumped together, and that was in the disposition of the schooner. We both desired to have her stranded safe enough in a sheltered place, and so that, when the time came, she could be got off again with as little labor and danger as might be. While I was thus turning the business over in my mind, I had not been idle with my body. I had stolen back to the cabin, slipped once more into my shoes, and laid my hand at random on a bottle of wine. And now, with this for an excuse, I made my reappearance. Hands lay as I had left him, all fallen together in a bundle and with his eyelids lowered as though he were too weak to bear the light. He looked up, however, at my coming, knocked the neck off the bottle like a man who had done the same thing often, and took a good swig, with his favorite toast of here's luck, then he lay quiet, Cut me a junko, that, says he, for I haven't no knife and hardly strength enough, so be as I had. Ah, uh, Jim, Jim, I reckon I've missed stays, cut me a quid, as'll likely be the last. Lad, for I'm for my long home, and no mistake. Well, said I, now, you tell me why, why, I cried. You were asking me just now about the dead. You've broken your trust. You lived in sin and lies and blood. There's a man you killed lying at your feet this moment, and you ask me why? 
For God, hands, that's why. I spoke with a little heat, thinking of the bloody dirk he had hidden in his pocket and designed, in his ill thoughts, to end me with. He, for his part, took a great draught of the wine and spoke with the most unusual solemnity. For thirty years, he said, I've sailed the seas and seen good and bad, better and worse, fair weather and foul, provisions running out, not well, now I tell you, I never seen good come o' oh goodness yet. Him as strikes first is my fancy. Dead men don't bite. Them's my views, amen, so be it. And now you look here, he added, suddenly changing his tone. We've had about enough of this foolery. The tide's made good enough by now. You just take my orders, Captain Hawkins, and we'll sail slap in and be done with it. All told, we had scarce two miles to run, but the navigation was delicate. I think I was a good prompt subaltern, and I am very sure that Hans was an excellent pilot, for we went about and about and dodged in shaving the banks, with a certainty, and scarcely had we passed the heads before the land closed around us. The shores of North Inlet were as thickly wooded as those of the southern anchorage, but the space was longer and narrower and more like what in truth it was, the estuary of a river. Right before us, at the southern end, we saw the wreck of a ship in the last stages of dilapidation. It had been a great vessel of three masts, but had lain so long exposed to the injuries of the weather that it was hung about, with great webs of dripping seaweed, and on the deck of it shore bushes had taken It was a sad sight, but it showed us that the anchorage was calm. Now, said Hans, look there. There's a pet bit for to beach a ship in. Fine flat sand, never a cat's paw, trees all around of it, and flowers a-blowing like a garden on that old ship. And once beached, I inquired how shall come high water, all hands take a pull upon the line, and off she comes as sweet as nature. And now, boy, stand by. We were near the bit now, and she's too much way on her. Starboard a little, so steady, starboard, larboard a little, steady, steady, so he issued his commands, which I breathlessly obeyed, till all of a sudden he cried, Now! The excitement of these last manoeuvres had somewhat interfered with the watch I had kept hitherto, sharply enough, upon the coxswain. Even then I was still so much interested, waiting for the ship to touch, that I had quite forgot the peril that hung over my head and stood craning over the starboard bulwarks and watching the ripples spreading. I might have fallen without a struggle for my life had not a sudden disquietude seized upon me and made me turn my head. Perhaps I had heard a creak or seen his shadow moving with the tail of my eye. Perhaps it was an instinct like a cat's. But sure enough, when I looked round, there was hands, we must both have cried out aloud when our eyes met, but while mine was the shrill cry of terror, his was a roar of fury like a charging bully's. At the same instant, he threw himself forward, and I leaped sideways towards the bows. As I did so, I let go of the tiller, which sprang sharp to leeward, and I think this saved my life, for it struck hands across the chest and stopped him, for the moment before he could recover. I was safe out of the corner where he had me trapped, with all the deck to dodge about. Just forward of the main mast I stopped, drew a pistol from my pocket, took a cool aim, though he had already turned and was once more coming directly after me, and drew the trick. The hammer fell, but there followed neither flash nor sound. The priming was useless with sea water. I cursed myself for my neglect. Why had not I long before reprimed and reloaded my only weapons? Then I should not have been as now, a mere fleeing sheep before this butcher. Wounded as he was, it was wonderful how fast he could move, his grizzled hair tumbling over his face, and his face itself as red as a red ensign with his haste and fury. I had no time to try my other pistol, nor indeed much inclination, for I was sure it would be useless. One thing I saw plainly, I must not simply retreat before him, or he would speedily hold me boxed into the bows, as a moment since he had so nearly boxed me in the stern. 
once so caught, and nine or ten inches of the blood-stained dirk would be my last experience on this side of eternity. I placed my palms against the main mast, which was of a goodish bigness, and waited every nerve upon the stretch. Seeing that I meant to dodge, he also paused. And a moment or two passed in feints on his part and corresponding movements upon mine. It was such a game as I had often played at home about the rocks of Black Hill Cove, but never before, you may be sure, with such a wildly beating heart as now. Still, as I say, it was a boy's game, and I thought I could hold my own at it against an elderly seaman with a wounded thigh. Indeed, my courage had begun to rise so high that I allowed myself a few darting thoughts on what would be the end of the affair, and while I saw certainly that I could spin it out for long, I saw no... Well, while things stood thus, suddenly the Hispaniola struck staggered, ground for an instant in the sand, and then, swift as a blow, canted over to the port side. We were both of us capsized in a second, and both of us rolled, almost together, into the scuppers. The dead red cap, with his arms still spread out, tumbled. So near were we, indeed, that my head came against the coxswain's foot with a crack that made my teeth rattle. Blow and all. I was the first afoot again, for hands had got involved with the dead body. The sudden canting of the ship had made the deck no place for running on. I had to find some new way of escape, and that upon the instant, for my foe was almost touching me. Quick as thought, I sprang into the mizzen shrouds, rattled up hand over hand, and did not draw a breath till I was seated on the cross trees. I had been saved by being prompt. The dirk had struck not half a foot below me as I pursued my upward flight, and there stood his raw hands with his mouth open and his face upturned. Now that I had a moment to myself, I lost no time in changing the priming of my pistol and then, having one ready for service, and to make assurance doubly sure, I pre my new employment struck hands all of a heap. He began to see the dice going against him, and after an obvious hesitation, he also hauled himself heavily into the shroud. It cost him no end of time, and groans to haul his wounded leg behind him, and I had quietly finished my arrangements before he was much more than a third of the way up. Then, with a pistol in either hand, I addressed him. One more step, Mr. Hans, said I, and I'll blow your brains out. Dead men don't bite, you know. I added with a chuckle. He stopped instantly. I could see by the working of his face that he was trying to think, and the process was so slow and laborious that, in my newfound security, I laughed aloud. At last, with a swallow or two, he spoke, his face still wearing the same expression of extreme perplexity. In order to speak he had to take the dagger from his mouth, but in all else he remained unmoved. Jim, says he, I reckon we refouled, you and me, and we'll have to sign articles. I'd have had you but for that there lurch, but I don't have no luck, not I, and I reckon I'll have to strike, which comes hard, you see, for a master mariner to a ship's younker like you, Jim. Something sang like in a row through the air. I felt a blow and then a sharp pang, and there I was pinned by the shoulder to the mast. In the horrid pain and surprise of the moment I scarce can say it was by my own volition, and I am sure it was without a conscious aim of my pistols went off, and both escaped out. They did not fall alone. With a choked cry, the coxswain loosed his grasp upon the shrouds and plunged head first into the water. Twenty-seven pieces of eight owing to the cant of the vessel. The masts hung far out over the water, and from my perch on the cross trees I had nothing below me but the surface of the bay. Hans, who was not so far up, was in consequence nearer to the ship and fell between me and the bulwarks. He rose once to the surface in a lather of foam and blood and then sank again for good. As the water settled, I could see him lying huddled together on the clean, bright sand in the shadow of the vessel's sides. A fish or two whipped past his body. Sometimes, by the quivering of the water, he appeared to move a little, as if he were trying to rise. But he was dead enough, for all that, 
being both shot and drowned, and was food for fish in the very place where he had designed my slaughter. I was no sooner certain of this than I began to feel sick, faint, and terrified. The hot blood was running over my back and chest. The dirk, where it had pinned my shoulder to the mast, seemed to burn like a hot iron. Yet it was not so much these real sufferings that distressed me for these, it seemed to me, I clung with both hands till my nails atched, and I shut my eyes as if to cover up the peril. Gradually my mind came back again, my pulses quieted down to a more natural time, and I was once more in possession of myself. It was my first thought to pluck forth the dirk, but either it stuck too hard or my nerve failed me, and I desisted with a violent shudder. Oddly enough, that very shudder did the business. The knife, in fact, had come the nearest in the world to missing me altogether. It held me by a mere pinch of skin, and this the shudder tore away. The blood ran down the faster, to be sure, but I was my own master again and only tacked to the mast by my coat and shirt. These last I broke through with a sudden jerk, and then regained the deck by the starboard shrouds. For nothing in the world would I have again ventured, shaken as I was, upon the overhanging port shrouds from which Israel had so lately fallen. I went below and did what I could for my wound. It pained me a good deal and still bled freely, but it was neither deep nor dangerous, nor did it greatly gall me when I used my arm. Then I looked around me, and, as the ship was now, in a sense, my own, I began to think of clearing it from its last passenger, the dead man O'Brien. He had pitched, as I have said, against the bulwarks, where he lay like some horrible, ungainly sort of puppet, life-size indeed, but how different from life's color. He went in with a sounding plunge. The red cap came off and remained floating on the surface, and as soon as the splash subsided, I could see him and his role lying side by side. O'Brien, though still quite a young man, was very bald. There he lay, with that bald head across the knees of the man who had killed him and the quick fishes steering to and fro over both. I was now alone upon the ship. The tide had just turned. The sun was within so few degrees of setting that already the shadow of the pines upon the western shore began to reach right across the anchorage and fall in patterns on the deck. The evening breeze had sprung up, and though it was well warded off by the hill with the two peaks upon the east, the cordage had begun to sing a little softly to itself, and the idle sails to rattle. I began to see a danger to the ship. The jibs I speedily doused and brought tumbling to the deck, but the mainsail was a harder matter. Of course, when the schooner canted over, the boom had swung out board, and the cap of it and a foot or two of sail hung even under water. I thought this made it still more dangerous. Yet the strain was so heavy that I half feared to meddle. At last I got my knife and cut the halyards. The peak dropped instantly. A great belly of loose canvas floated broad upon the water. And since, pull as I liked, I could not budge the downhaul. That was the extent. For the rest, the Hispaniola must trust to luck, like myself. By this time the whole anchorage had fallen into shadow the last rays, I remember, falling through a glade of the wood and shining bright as jewels on the flowery mantle of the wreck. It began to be chill. The tide was rapidly fleeting seaward, the schooner settling more and more on her beam ends. I scrambled forward and looked over. It seemed shallow enough, and holding the cut hawser in both hands for a last security, I let myself drop softly overboard. The water scarcely reached my waist. The sand was firm and covered with ripple marks, and I waded ashore in great spirits, leaving the Hispaniola on her side. About the same time, the sun went fairly down and the breeze whistled low in the dusk among the tossing pines. At least, and at last, I was off the sea, nor had I returned thence empty-handed. There lay the schooner, clear at last from buccaneers and ready for our own men to board and get to sea again. I had nothing nearer my fancy than to get home to the stockade and boast of my achievements. Possibly I might be blamed a bit for my truantry, 
but the recapture of the Hispaniola was a clenching answer, and I hoped that even Captain Smollett would confess I had not lost my time. So thinking, and in famous spirits, I began to set my face homeward for the blockhouse and my companions.